central banks. <laughs> moral suasion, moral suasion. What is that? It's a fancy term that central banks use. It's like macro prudential regulation. It can affect your finances. And we're gonna ask Jeff Snyder, the head of global research for Alhambra Partners. My name is Emil Kalinowski. We're gonna ask Jeff what that means because Jeff, welcome to the show. You wrote something not too long ago. In fact, let me say it was on January 13th at the Alhambra Investments uh, blog. Uh, you wrote a title and it's called, you wrote an article and the title is Suasion. Sure, but is it really moral? And you start out by saying that, hey, we probably heard this in our economics class. Jeff, the very, I didn't. I did not. I went to Arizona State University. They did not talk to us about moral suasion or macroprudential regulation. The first time I ever heard the term moral suasion was in an article, it was a working paper by Carmen Reinhart and M. Bellin Sprancia, The Liquidation of Government Debt. And it's all about how the government and the central banks and the regulators will encourage financial institutions to do what they, the government, wants them to do to achieve a certain end. Is that what moral suasion is? Yeah, Emil, good morning. And that's exactly what moral suasion is. It's getting people to do things that you want them to do without hitting them over the head and, and committing physical violence, or in this case, monetary violence, right? And but look, I, I look back to my, my own economics training at a small school in Buffalo, New York, and what we were taught was Federal Reserve, money printer, open market operations, federal funds rate, all this really big, powerful stuff. And then, oh, by the way, moral suasion. And it's like, wait a minute, what, what was that last one? You kind of stuck that one in. What is moral suasion? Moral suasion is essentially we're big and bad. We're the government. We're the Federal Reserve. We have all the power on our side. So just do what the hell we say so that we don't have to force ourselves upon you because it's going to happen anyway. And if you stop and think about it, it sounds – Okay, that sounds pretty good if you think don't fight the Fed because the Fed can do whatever the Fed doesn't want it to do or, or the Fed can do whatever it wants it to do. And then therefore it gets the market to do these things, whatever it wants the market to do. But if you think, well, what if the Fed's just puffing itself up because it really doesn't have the ability to do these things and it's trying to get convince everyone else to do these things on its behalf because that's the only way these things will ever get done – the world looks like a very, very different place. And the, the uh, paper that you cited that uh, Mr. Reinhardt wrote, I think is a very good example of the overextended attitude that authorities have for their ability to influence behavior. And then really what it amounts to, especially through that period they called the Great Moderation, was taking credit for anything that happened that was positive. See, we got the markets to do it on our behalf because that's what we wanted the markets to do. When in fact, most of the times you look at individual cases as we will do uh, going forward in the show, especially the Japanese cases, you'll see that the markets were just doing things because the markets were doing things without any regard to monetary policy. So moral suasion is sort of a, I don't wanna say it's a made up thing because it does have historical precedence, but in terms of monetary policy and economics, it's sort of a, well, what do we do since we don't actually do money? Well, the, the article, I keep calling it an article, but the working paper that was submitted to the National Bureau of Economic Research in March 2011, moral suasion in this article was the lightest touch because this article was all about the liquidation of government debt. And on a continuum, you have laissez-faire government touch, so very, very not even touching the, uh, the economy. Then you have moral suasion, do what we want you to do. Then there's regulation. And then this, this working paper was all about financial repression. So this was hardcore post-World War II debt reduction uh, regulations. And so moral suasion was the lightest touch. And as an example, I suppose, in your article, in your blog post here, you bring up Bernanke and you said that he, one of his examples was that we conclude that under, a, this is a quote of Bernanke's, that they have a printer. And he, in a speech, you can tell the audience where the speech is from. He said, he, he said, we conclude that under a paper money system, a determined government can always generate, generate higher spending and hence positive 
inflation. Now, for our, that when, I, when you first hear it, you think, yeah, all right, they can print. But for our audience, the key word is in a paper money system. We're not in a paper money system. We're in a oh. bank credit system. So Virtual money system. It's amazing. It's right here. He well, he it was in a paper I think, money know, system. Yeah, I can't believe it. Go on. Bernanke was technically correct, but again, he was exercising moral suasion in doing so. He was being disingenuous. What he said was, yes, the Federal Reserve can print Federal Reserve notes. And that is absolutely true. They can print physical money, but most commerce since the 1920s doesn't run on physical money. It runs through the banking system. And so he was being, what he thought was being clever. In fact, for a long time, it worked. And what he was really saying was exactly what you were saying before about the Reinhardt paper, financial repression. What he says, except this is the opposite case of financial repression. This is, suppo this is the, def the inflationary repression, right? And so what Bernanke was saying in 2002 was, look, if the market doesn't want to act the way we want it to in, in terms of counteracting deflation, then we'll just get out our big stick printing press and start printing some damn money and inflation will happen because that's all it takes. That's what his speech boiled down to was, look, if the government wants inflation, the government will get inflation. And so why bother going through all of that problem? The market should just obey us and give us the inflation we want because otherwise we'll just do it ourselves. And eventually you say, well, maybe you need to do it yourself because we're not seeing it. And that's really what moral suasion is, is saying, you know, it's, it's always threatening. It's always posturing. It's always stating. And you think about that in the context of the last, you know, 12, 13 years, what the market has said, okay, We've listened to your threats and your posturing and your, your coercion, except now we have a real monetary problem that we need some real damn money into it. So put up or shut up. And that's really what to the 2008 crisis was in essence from a monetary policies perspective was the market saying, look, we've, we believed you. We've believed in you for all these years. We believe you have a printing press and can do whatever you want, but these problems are too big and too real. We can't face this global dollar shortage without some actual money in the system. We need some help, Ben. And Ben said, well, <laughs> here's some more moral suasion. We'll do some <laughs> TAF auctions and we'll do some dollar swap, overseas dollar swaps and all these other things that are just more pretend action. We'll, do, we'll increase the level of bank reserves to, to give our moral suasion a little bit more credibility because it looks like we're printing money. When in fact, you know, as you pointed out, Emil, yeah, in, in a paper money system that might have worked, but we don't have a paper money system anymore. And we're not picking on Bernanke because in that speech in 2002, he knew perfectly well what was happening in Japan and that they were struggling doing exactly what Bernanke said they would be able to do, able to. And in a previous episode, we talked about how at first they weren't being uh, irrational or out of control. Uh, but in the mid nineties, they finally listened to Paul Krugman and they blew out the doors with massive fiscal spending, what we thought at the time and zero interest rates and QE that all happened by 2002. Bernanke knew it, but he said, well, the United States and West Europe is different. Maybe they'll be able to, uh, maybe we'll be able to do it if we ever had to, but we won't because we're in the great moderation because everyone believes our moral suasion. And I love this little quote here that you put in, because paraphrasing Mark Twain or Abe Lincoln, better to keep the government's printing press in its back pocket and be thought powerless by some than to actually turn the thing on and remove all doubt from everyone, which is what's happened over the last 13 years. Jeff. Yeah, you, that's Emil. That's really the point of this year or last year too, 2020, right? The level of bank reserves and the, this quantitative easing equated with money printing isn't really money printing. It's attempting to give the moral suasion, this inflationary idea, more credibility. It's the idea that, looks, the layperson on the street has no idea what the Federal Reserve actually does. They have no idea what bank reserves actually are, but they look and sound like they're money printing, right? And you can see, if you, if you care to, the level of bank reserves have exploded on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, which sounds like money printing. It looks like money printing. There's a number there that goes up tremendously. But what we find time and again is that despite the explosion in bank reserves, it doesn't lead to inflation. And let's be perfectly clear here. We're not really talking about inflation. We're not really seeking out consumer price increases that are going to further increase the misery upon most, uh, most of the economic participants. What we're looking for is inflation as a confirmation, a sign that 
monetary policy has worked, that money and credit are flowing through the economy again, that recovery processes have not only taken hold, they look to be sustainable. That's really what inflation tells us, is that not only has the recovery started, it's going to keep going, which is what we want. That's the thing we want to see. So in a lot of, a lot of ways, inflation is kind of like the last step before we get to the promised land. And what we keep finding over the last 13 years is they keep promising we're going to get into recovery and economic growth and acceleration that we'll see and be confirmed by inflationary acceleration, but it never happens. And so now here we are in 2020 and 2021 in even worse shape than we've been at any point in the last 13 years, and yet is taken for granted that this quote unquote money printing is going to lead to inflationary acceleration and economic growth and recovery. Alan Greenspan was convinced that money supply is tied to inflation. And if you don't like Alan Greenspan, what about Milton Friedman? He won, he won one of those prizes, the Nobel Prize. He also believed that inflation and money supply were intrinsically linked. Perhaps you don't like him because he was an American. Then we have Nicholas Copernicus. He figured out that the earth was rotating around the sun in a previous episode, and he's Polish. That's not bad. And he said, same thing, supply of money, inflation. Let's talk about inflation right now. Oh, you know what? Before I do that, though, you know who I want to include with those four incredible characters? Steve Van Meter. That's right. He was on a Real uh, Vision interview recently with Michael Ashton, January 13th. If anyone's watching this and they can watch that video, I encourage it. The whole show was about inflation. It was about shadow stats, the Chapwood Index. They dove into it deep, face first, so I encourage everyone to check out that show. Jeff, those five people that I just mentioned, they believe that inflation and money is all related, meaning where is inflation today? What are the latest reading telling us about inflation, money supply? What have you seen in CPI? Well, the latest CPI for the month of December was, uh, especially the core rates among the lowest in, in the CPI's history. Even the headline CPI rate, which has been boosted by oil prices a little bit in December, still was among the lowest of the last couple, uh, last decade. But it's really the core rates which tell us what's going on in the real economy. Discounting pricing power by corporations passing along supposedly increased uh, production costs to, and this money supply that, that goes along with it, increased cost and increased inflation to the consumer, which we should be able to see in a broad-based fashion. Again, that's what inflation actually is. It's not prices of a certain class of products going up or one or another. It's the prices of everything going up. And instead, when we look at the core rates, especially, you know, the, the CPI less food and energy prices, as well as the services price rate, uh, excluding rent, both of those are among the low, again, as I said, in December, among the lowest in each series history. And the percentiles are just ridiculously low. I think in the, uh, in the core CPI, it was the 12th or 13th percentile which means rarely have we seen this low. 88% of the time. It's yeah, higher. which is eight, it's been higher. And again, this is December 2020. After nine months of heavy Fed money printing, market support, stock market records, all of these things that supposedly point into the direction of runaway inflation, not just regular inflation, but runaway inflation as we keep hearing. Maybe even hyperinflation, dollar crash, all these big things. And yet in terms of consumer prices, we're seeing – among the lowest levels of inflation, which indicates lack of consumer pricing power among companies, and therefore I'll have a lot of discounting, which is suppressing these averages. And in the service sector, which is where you would see this monetary inflation most, I believe the percentile was the third percentile. Mm -hmm. So it's not just low of the low. And then look, the last 10 years, the last 12 years, 11 years of, of the, this particular index have been low anyway. It's among the lowest of the lowest decade on record. So it's, you can't, it's almost like you could, it, it's the lowest possible amount of inflation in December 2020, which isn't just, hey, what's going on with QE? It directly contradicts the idea that we have an explosive money printing situation here, which then gets us back to the original question was, what do Federal Reserve and what do central banks actually do? And they try to persuade you that they do inflationary things, hoping that you'll act in a way that creates deflation that they will then take credit for so, so as to reinforce their credibility, which is all that monetary policy actually is. I was listening to a podcast whose name escapes me, but it was a podcast for economists. 
that believe that central banks are central kind of a podcast. And they were talking about uh, Bernanke's job and how, what a job, good job he did. And uh, the host pushed back and said, you know, I don't know, how, how good was it? And the, uh, the guest said, well, it was good because look at how Europe did worse. And that's something that Bernanke did in a paper, right? In a newspaper article, 2010, yeah. 2012? 2015. Okay, 2015. The time runs together when you're in a depression. And he said, well, it's much better than Europe. How about, do you, I know you didn't write about it in your article, but off the top of your head, do you see numbers that are different in Europe? when it comes to inflation or maybe even Japan, is this a global issue that reaching such low levels despite central bank printing? Or is it just a US phenomenon? No, it's everywhere. European inflation is actually much worse, which is, I mean, that's true. What Bernanke said in 2015 was actually true. And what, what anybody wants to say is yes, the US wasn't as bad as Europe, but that's not the same thing. It's not at all the same thing as saying Bernanke was successful. Hey, we weren't the worst of the worst. Big, that's not a, that's not a, a, a that's not a standard for good job performance. That's just saying, look, I better cover my ass because people are going to start asking questions. Hey, at least we're not Europe. It's not something you want to brag about unless that's all you've got. And so, yeah. So the question of 2020 and continuing Bernanke's tradition of QE money printing, QE version of bank reserves and raising those levels. Yeah, U.S. inflation is among the lowest in history. In Europe, it actually is the lowest in history. Their core inflation rates were, for the fourth consecutive month, just 0.2%. That's two basis points, uh, uh, 20 basis points of inflation in after even more enormous money printing. The level of bank reserves in Europe since March, middle of March has doubled, doubled the, the quote unquote money printing and inflation is the lowest on record for the fourth straight month running. And there isn't any sign that it's going to be any better. Uh, Japan, same thing. Japan is not not necessarily the lowest on record, but their inflation rates are the lowest since the early parts of the last decade. So we're going back to before the tsunami into the, you know 2009, 2010, back in outright deflation in the, uh, both the core rate and the uh, CPI. So again, massive amounts of quote unquote QE bank reserve money printing and no inflation there either. So it really gets back to the situation we described. What is it? What does it these central banks actually do? And if you believe that they're printing money and you act as if, oh my God, the currency is going to go down and inflation is going to rise next year because look at what the Fed's doing. They think that you'll go out tomorrow and start spending, or if you're an employer, you'll start hiring people. And you do these things because you believe the cost of doing those things in the future will go way up. So you do them today. Well, that's really what this is all about, trying to convince you to move up activity to today that you might not otherwise undertake because you think that inflation is going to be robust over the years ahead. I'm disappointed to hear you say that you can't say, well, I did better than Europe, because that's exactly the line I used in my recent annual review. Uh, so that's not good news. I went over better with my boss. But let's hear, okay, in Bernanke's defense or central bank's defense. What about producer prices? We don't see it in consumer prices. What about producer prices? I'm in uh, the metals and mining industry and I know that copper prices are doing really well and palladium, but palladium's always doing very well. Uh, I heard that lumber prices are up very strongly. You address this issue in an article and uh, it's called, if the Fed's not in consumer prices, then how about producer prices? Alhambra Partners blog, January 15th. Jeff, what did you write in this article? Well, basically what you just said, right? It, look, if, if it's not in consumer prices, maybe it's, okay, we know commodity prices, especially industrial commodity prices are having a really good time. Copper prices, most of all, they're up to, to levels that we haven't seen in a very, very long time. And so, in the course, the percentage rates work out to be very fair. Was it 65, 70% increase in copper prices from the low? I mean, really tremendous stuff. And so, okay, maybe the Fed's money printing isn't in consumer prices. Maybe it's just starting to work its way through the, the supply chain, starting with raw material first, because as you know, a lot of people understand, commodities are one place that you go to protect yourself from future inflation. So maybe that's what's happening. Commodity prices are screaming higher and that will then translate into the rest of the economy, go into producer prices. And then finally, as, as companies pass along these increased commodity costs to 
consumers in the form of consumer. We haven't seen the consumer prices yet, but maybe it's starting at the factory gate and it hasn't, hasn't worked its way through. Except no, <laughs> that hasn't happened either. In fact, the PPI, which again, surveys a broad, a broad level uh, or a broad uh, a number of producer prices, including commodity prices, inventory prices, finished good prices, all those kinds of things throughout the supply chain. And what they find is that yes, producer prices are rebounding from their lows earlier in last year, including the massive increases in commodity prices. However, uh, as far as overall inflation through the producer channel goes, it's still among the lowest in the series. It's, you still haven't seen producer prices go anywhere near uh, some, some levels that would make it look like that uh, there's some kind of imminent price spike available. In fact, the latest PPI for December was about where it had been throughout much of 2013, 2014, again, on the way down in 2019. So despite the fact that industrial commodity prices are going up through the roof, seemingly because of inflationary money printing, it hasn't, hasn't in any way filtered its way into a broad, a broad uh, swath of producer prices. Let's talk about one more commodity before we wrap up this section. And it was brought up in the Steve Van Meter and Michael Ashton Real Vision interview I brought up. And that's that people, people's inflation expectations correlate like this with gasoline prices. You raise gasoline prices, or at least oil, in your article. Is there anything happening there? I, I know that gasoline prices or oil prices are rising. What did you see in that commodity market? Well, I think it's the same thing that's in all the rest of the industrial commodities. That first of all, uh, a lot of the, the price increases in them or what's going on in, the, in the, uh, the markets themselves for those industrial commodities and including the oil market is depressed production. And then you have also hoarding that we talked about in a previous episode. So you have you know, basically a, a supply story rather than a demand story and especially nothing like a money printing story. And I think you're right because most people perceive of prices based on what they do, what they pay at their local gas station. And even though gasoline prices are up, they're still down compared to where they were a year ago. So things are rising, things are rebounding from the bottom, but coming back from the bottom, which is sort of inflationary, isn't actually inflationary, especially when you don't see it through a broad section of not just consumer, but also producer prices. It's it's, it's a very narrow trend. And then really, when you look at it in context, in an overall context, it looks nothing like the, the money printing moral suasion part of the story. Jeff, is there anything that we didn't cover in this series of articles that you wanted to bring up right now? Not that I know of. I think we got most of it. <laughs> Excellent. I'm going to get a plus on my uh, hosting duties then. Well, ladies and gentlemen, in part two of this episode, we're going to discuss bond bubbles, but are they bubbles? And is there a fundamental reason why bond prices are so high? We're gonna to turn to Japan and we're gonna see if it's a bubble or a bubble with fundamental purpose behind it.